Hi, I'm Danielle Harvey, the Festival Director of the Festival of Dangerous Ideas, and welcome to our final session of FODI Digital. It's been an illuminating weekend of interesting conversation at a most unusual time. Last month, like so many events across the world, the Festival of Dangerous Ideas was unable to take place due to COVID-19 and the government bans. So now we turn to considering the political, economic and social shifts that await us in a post-pandemic world. You can join the chat and ask questions. And for now, I'm going to hand over to the chair of this session, Simon Longstaff. Simon. Well, thank you very much, Danielle, and hello, everybody. Uh, dangerous realities indeed. At this time, the dangerous ideas we'll be looking at with the panel, which I'll introduce in a moment, are two. Firstly, the notion that we might just simply snap back from the current situation uh, as if nothing much has changed. And secondly, the notion of reality. What is the day-to-day -day reality we left behind and what might we be embracing? To help me do that, I'm joined today by three excellent uh, contributors to this discussion. Rebecca Huntley, who is a noted author, commentator, writer in all sorts of ways. She's an adjunct lecturer at the University of New South Wales, but is probably best known as a foremost social researcher here in Australia. And then with Rebecca, we'll be joined by Tim Soot Pomasan, who's a political philosopher and a human rights activist. Tim is currently involved at the University of Sydney, but is formerly a race discrimination commissioner with the Human Rights Commissioner. And I welcome Tim. And last but not least, the journalist, um, noted Australian journalist who's operated both here and abroad, much awarded, Stan Grant. Uh, Stan's appeared on CNN, on our own uh, ABC, and is now working as a professor, as well as a journalist, at Charles Sturt University. Welcome to you, Stan. Uh, in this session, uh, there's a number of things we're going to cover, which have been touched upon during the course of this weekend of conversations with Fody Digital. But before I start to get into some of the more fine-grained elements, I thought I'd begin by asking each of you, starting with you, Rebecca, for what you think will be the major change likely to emerge from this recent period of COVID-19 to this point and what we might anticipate in the future. Rebecca, what do you think might emerge? Well, I'm going to try and be positive and think about a really positive change that might happen. And one positive change is a greater recognition in the community about the value of certain workers and both doing paid and unpaid work in our society. Um, I think any parent homeschooling uh, their kids has a greater appreciation of, of um, what teachers do and, and hopefully would be very supportive of any kind of pay rise for teachers. But even if we think about some of the most valuable people in our, uh, in our society and economy as we go through this pandemic, it's people who deliver our food. It's people who stack supermarket shelves. It's people that clean um, our hospitals as well as all the healthcare workers. And in many ways, these are people who aren't necessarily particularly well paid um, and sometimes have to deal with quite precarious work. So they're really the ones allowing us to stay isolated, to stay safe, just some of those people. And I really hope that we have a greater appreciation of their contribution to our society and our economy. And um, I hope we don't forget that when we vote in elections in the future. Stan, what do you think will be the major themes to emerge? I want to sort of pull the lens back a little bit and have a look at the global picture and Australia's place in it. I think the coronavirus crisis has accelerated something that was always going to confront us, and that is how do we live in a world where the biggest economic power is an authoritarian regime that does not share Western liberal democratic values and that is China. At the same time, going into this crisis, the West broadly was already going through a deep period of reflection and soul searching. We have been politically polarised. There's been a rise of populism, deeply entrenched and debilitating culture wars. There has been an erosion of freedom in the West. Freedom House now counts 13 straight years of declining democracy. So the coronavirus really arrived as part of a, a perfect storm. If we take 1989 and the end of 
you know, the Soviet empire and the, the end of history, as Francis Fukuyama said, the triumph of liberal democracy. And we trace the trajectory since then. We have seen the attacks on 9-11 that precipitated two still ongoing wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, caused a mass movement of people as they were displaced in various parts of the world. We saw the global financial crisis, which weakened the Western economies. And of course, the continued juggernaut of China as its economy grew and its influence spread. The coronavirus has accelerated that. It has been part of that perfect storm. And I think our place in the world, the future of globalism, nationalism, sovereignty, these are always going to be critical issues. And I think the coronavirus has brought those front and centre. Thanks. And finally, your initial thoughts, Tim? As, as Stan has pointed out, there will be profound geopolitical implications from this crisis. And at the heart of that is the contest between America and uh, China as, as superpowers. Uh, it's, it's still too early to know exactly how things are going to play out, but I certainly think the American response to the crisis has done significant damage to its global prestige. Uh, China's uh, handling of the coronavirus is also, of course, subject to a lot of debate, and we'll see that play out in time and have and, and see the domestic implications of that as well. Um, as, as Rebecca said, I, I would hope that out of this crisis we have a greater appreciation of society and of the social importance of uh, cooperation and the fact that an economy cannot exist in, in, in isolation from society, that we, we draw our meaning as human beings from our social connections. I, I think that is hopefully one very big or two very big lessons that we draw from the current situation. Now, whether we draw those lessons, though, is, is still unclear. I, I think a lot's going to depend on how we, we do transition into a, a return to uh, activity as we would normally know it or something resembling that, if we're able to make a transition back into uh, to, to, to regular or semi-regular economic and social activity, uh, people may uh, think that they can just uh, settle back into things. But, but I think the economic effects of what's happening are going to be enormously profound, and that's going to create all sorts of social and political pressures and change that uh, we may not necessarily foresee right now. Uh, one other thing I'd, I'd point out is the, the fact that we are perhaps becoming more inward-looking, that it's striking to find that there, there, there's been uh, a multitude of national responses to this crisis, but relatively little international cooperation. So the world will have a choice after this between greater international cooperation or uh, forms of nationalism verging on autarky or, or, or economic and social in, uh, in independence and autonomy. Um, the drawbridge in Australia, for example, has already been drawn with the complete or near complete stop of international travel. Uh, I think this is going to be a fundamental choice facing our society and others um, once we come out of the immediate crisis. Thanks, Tim. Look, I think what I might do is split our conversation into two parts, looking at some of the domestic issues and the international ones just a little deeper. Not that they're completely separate. I think as we've just heard, they're intimately related. But I want to stick with you, Tim. You're talking about a return to a world which is something like that which was there before. I just wonder what you think about the likelihood of that. I think a lot of us have been watching, for example, the evolution of new technologies in robotics, AI, uh, biotech which there was a prediction, say, that within 10 years there would be large-scale displacement of people from employment, right from the person driving the taxi through to the lawyer or accountant. I'm wondering whether or not, um, for all of the horror we've had with this particular virus and its effects around the world, if it's been something of an early taste of a different kind of world that might be coming. And do you think we've learned any lessons from this current experience that we might be able to put to work in terms of addressing this new kind of future, Tim? Predicting the future is dangerous business, but uh, I suppose we've got to get into that territory if this is a festival of dangerous ideas, right, Simon? Uh, I, I don't think we are yeah. going to return back to the old normal. So the notion of there being a hibernation that the, the nation is going through is is, in my view, misguided in one sense. I, I don't think things will be the same. But, but at the same time, I don't think 
they're going to radically change overnight. Uh, I think it's going to be, be evolving over the course of some years, uh, but we may be getting a taste of, of things right now. The fact that we're, we're going to see more people, I think, work from home. Uh, I think we're, we're likely to see uh, perhaps less direct or intimate social interaction, uh, particularly if we don't find find a vaccine. Um, and, and I think given the uh, economic uh, consequences of, of a shutdown, uh, we will see industries evolve and be disrupted with new technologies being adopted in ways that we may or may not foresee. So there may well be an acceleration of AI and uh, and, and of uses of technology, including in, in parts of our life that we wouldn't have necessarily assumed. Uh, but I don't think we can predict with any confidence what everything's going to, to look like. Um, a lot's going to depend on whether there will be breakouts or successive breakouts of uh, of the virus in the next six to 12 months uh, once we get over this uh, initial initial hump. Um, but, 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 I, but I do think all of this means that it's profoundly uncertain and the changes we see in society or technology will also have political consequences. I, I think one of the, the big things that will emerge out of this is that populism and anti-democratic forces are going to receive a shot in the arm because there are, a lot of, there, there are going to be a lot of anxious, fearful people, whether it's people who are losing their jobs or whether it's people who are fearing outsiders or, or, or foreigners, um, and uh, how we how we handle the situation is 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 going to be immensely important. Uh, I, I think what we know as the democratic order in in our society, for example, is highly vulnerable, and we shouldn't for a moment take that for granted. Look, Rebecca Huntley, um, you began by offering a very positive view, if you like, of the lessons to come back, a revaluation, if you like, of the role of the teacher, the people who deliver our food and things of that kind. But I also wonder what you think about what Tim was just saying and this whole notion of a snapback, which suddenly sees an end to JobKeeper, potentially a reduction in JobSeeker. I mean, do, do you see the Australian public having been through this as embracing this very sudden reversion to a kind of economic orthodoxy? that may actually considerably disadvantage some of the very people that you were talking about. And of course, those who've never even been included in the coverage, particularly those from the arts and entertainment area. Yes, exactly. And, and I think all three of the speakers would agree that um, the support for the tertiary education sector could be also very much stronger, given they were the first industry to be almost affected in Australia and will be the, or may well be the last industry to be affected. Um, look, I have lots of, there's lots of dark clouds in my head about what's going to happen with COVID. I mean, and, you know, and a lot of it is very hard to speculate because a lot of it's got to do with the epidemiology, um, which is very different than kind of tracking the, the economics of it. I've been thinking a little bit about having the experience I had living through the global financial crisis and how Australians responded to that. Very, very different crisis, but one of the things that happened was... I was a bit surprised about how quickly people got over, in Australia, got over the global financial crisis and kind of reverted back to the concerns prior to that. Um, you know, there is this still very strong sense of, it may not be Australian exceptionalism, but this idea that, that it, because of who we are, the global forces affect us but not as badly. So it's not so much a kind of reinforcement of the idea of our country is kind of lucky and privileged, but we still have that kind of idea that we we tend to do better than other countries. So, and there will also be a kind of deep psychological desire to go back to life as normal as soon as possible. That being said, I think the very nature of this makes it quite different to the global financial crisis in that in that what we have seen in order to control the virus is basically a, a, as Tim said, a, a drawing up, you know, the drawbridge comes up. And when you've already got a significant part of the population questioning whether Australia does particularly well in a global economy, whether workers do well, you already have, you know, anxieties in our society about immigration, about the role of China, then you've got the exacerbation of those concerns and this kind of idea that, oh, maybe we just need, you know, we just need to do it, you know, go it alone and that international cooperation and the kinds of organisations, whether that be the UN or the World Health Organisation, 
um, that have, were built out of great global conflict um, are really worth are really worth us being involved in them. So I, I am really mm. worried about the extent to which, and that's not an argument against self sufficiency. That's not an argument against making sure that we have a strong manufacturing industry here, and that if these kinds of things happen in the future, we can survive. But I'm really worried about how something like this already exacerbates the kinds of anxieties that, as the other panellists have said, have driven really destructive um, movements like populism and all of the racism and other things that can that can flow from that. Now, for those of you who've been posing questions uh, about things like, is the US still a superpower and neoliberalism, please don't think I'm ignoring them. I'm just holding them in reserve till we get to the second half of this conversation, we want to focus more on in the international implications of this. But I don't want to leave our own domestic context just for now. Stan Grant, uh, when we look at the kind of pressure that has been placed upon institutions in the past, I'm thinking over the past 30 years, there's been a fairly significant reduction in trust in politicians and the churches and, and all the rest. And we're coming out of this terrible period of instability. And now we're talking about rebooting the nation where even if manufacturing does come back on to a large extent, it'll probably be highly mechanised. Do you think, Stan, that our, what I would call our ethical infrastructure, our institutions, political parties, the professions, all of those things are in strongest position coming out of COVID-19 than when we went in? And do you think if they are stronger, particularly in politics and trust for political leaders, that that will be sustained past the immediate part of the emergency? Well, there are two answers to that. Immediately during the crisis, we've seen a rise in the polling for support for our political leaders, the Prime Minister, the, the Premiers of the states. And that, I think, is a reflection of their prominence in our lives right now and the fact that we have broadly handled this well to, to flatten the curve to the extent that we have in the time that we have. We know, though, that those opinion polls move around very quickly and we're already seeing a return to politics. You know, the truce is over and the states and the federal government are already at loggerheads over things such as when to lift the restrictions. So politics is going to come roaring back. There's, there's no doubt about that. I, I think one of the, it has been a stress test for our institutions. And I think as a, a journalist as well, I think it's been a stress test for our journalism. One of the things that I've been very concerned about and this is speaking for someone who has worked deeply within it, is the proliferation, the impact and the influence of the 24-7 news cycle. I've been concerned for some time that it, it dangerously exaggerates threat, it accelerates decision-making, it creates a sense of panic and siege. The idea of conflict and confrontation is built into the model of 24-7 news. Each hour must be more dire than the next. It drags our politicians along in its wake and we expect immediate response and immediate decision-making. Uh, and I think it's created as well a sense of anxiety during the coronavirus crisis that clearly we've seen felt in our community. And we see this in the numbers of people who have contacted our support lines, such as Lifeline and others, concerned about things such as mental health. Other things have played a factor in that as well, the instability and uncertainty about the economy, being separated from our loved ones. But I have been concerned for some time about the media and the 24-7 media cycle, about the language that is constantly used, the language of lockdown and nightmare and catastrophe that creates this mm. sense of overwhelming anxiety, the wartime references that we've seen throughout this. I mean, mm. what we have been through has been traumatic. It has been a battle, but it has not been a war. And I can tell you, as someone who has covered war on the ground, anyone living in a war zone would give anything to have been locked down in their house, secure, no one bombing them, no one killing their children, with electricity and air conditioning and internet and Netflix and the government picking up your pay if you're laid off from your job. So, but, but, but the media creates this sense of, of conflict. And I think we're going to have to look at that coming out of this and the responsibility of the media in dealing with crises. Another thing that, I, that has concerned me 
and that is the erosion of the very thing that has underpinned our society, and that is our freedom. Now, we can argue the necessity of this to deal with a crisis that we're facing, a health crisis such as this, but, but the idea that we have more government in our lives is something that never sits comfortably with me. And speaking as an Indigenous person, our history tells us that whenever the government is in our lives, not much good comes from it. I don't like to have politicians constantly in our lives. I don't like to have politicians lecture me and behave and speak to me as if I'm a child and tell me how I need to take care and how they're looking out for my interests. That concerns me. Um, it's, it's really interesting, I think, Simon, that we have this situation where an authoritarian regime such as China, believes it has a better model and believes that it can deal with emergency and crisis in a more effective way. This coronavirus has struck us at our strongest point and revealed also its weakness. It struck at our freedom. It struck at our trust. It has isolated us from each other. And, and those ideas, coupled with the, the, the influence and the proliferation of technology that also erodes our privacy and our freedom are things we're going to have to be extremely vigilant about. Yeah, but if, we're, if we look at it, I mean, despite all the myths about Australians having a larrikin nature, I mean, this has been a pretty good example of the nation knuckling under governments telling us that we're ultimately responsible for the fate of the nation. And just look at the take-up of the the COVID safe app and the compliance with various physical distancing things. Rebecca, I'm not sure whether you're picking up yeah. in your research no, I would. what's been happening. Well, we haven't been able to do much face-to-face -face research, as you can imagine. But I would, in response to Stan, I do understand what he's trying to say. That being said, in my experience, um, if, if the community feel that what the government is asking them to do is a broader benefit to everyone. So we're asking you to engage in some kind of behaviour change for some people bigger than others and adapt, not forever, but for a, a short period of time to make sure that we save the healthcare system and we save lives, not only the lives of people that you know, but the lives of people that you don't know. Um, if people are prepared to accept that, then they're prepared to suspend certain kinds of freedoms that we perhaps should should value more and take for granted. Um, and I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I think that we wouldn't want that. We What we don't want is we don't want political leaders to use that as an opportunity to start to do a whole range of things that don't actually suit the challenge in front of us, which is dealing with this healthcare crisis. Now, if we have rolling crises, which we're likely to, right, we're going to have COVID go through the system and then we're going to face another bushfire season. And then if anybody who takes climate change seriously and looks at the um, projections for the next 10 years, we are going to have to get, get used to notions of crisis. So how do we build institutions? How do we build social capital? How do we build the kinds of leaders who can still value human, um, human freedoms, build trust, remain transparent at times of crises? This is a really the fundamental question about leadership ongoing. So I'm less concerned about people, um, you know, taking social distance thing seriously in the short term than I am about a longer term ability for our society to keep what we value, um, keep our democratic principles and keep our values at the centre as we face rolling crises in the next 10 years, whether they be economic, health or environmental. Tim, Tim Supalmasan, uh, Rebecca just mentioned the uh, climate change. And one of the things I think a lot of us have been struck by in terms of COVID-19 has been the ascendancy of science as the principal point of reference for public policy and conduct. And it's been quite stark, I think, in contrast to the way in which science has tended to be marginalised in the debate about climate change. 
do you think there's a lasting change here that's come about as a result of this in which now scientific expertise will be given much greater weight by the government, not just in relation to health, but in relation to some other matters as well? I hope so. I, I hope that we'll see greater valuing of scientific expertise in public, public policy and government decision making. That, that's been a clear a distinguishing feature of what's happened in the past few months. Uh, it, it, I suspect we'll see a generation of epidemiologists coming through as a result of, of this being inspired by what public health uh, expertise can, can do for society. Uh, uh, and, and the obvious question has been, well, why haven't we been valuing scientific expertise for other significant social and political issues, most obviously climate change? Um, whether, or not we, whether or not public opinion has shifted decisively uh, on, on this, uh, I think is still unclear. Um, uh, uh, but, but there is an important need here to, to think about how our institutions are built, going back to your earlier question, Simon, about our ethical infrastructure. I mean, if we look at things domestically in Australia for a moment, it, there's a paradox in the government's response here in that on the one hand, it, it is broadly following the public health advice. Uh, I don't think a chief medical officer has ever had as, as, as high a profile as, uh, as, as he has had in recent weeks and months. Uh, but then on, on the other hand, the government seems to be taking a pretty brutal line towards our universities as a sector, which is the, the place where expertise and scientific knowledge is nurtured and cultivated. And uh, many of Australia's universities are facing parlous futures because of the collapse in international student revenues. Um, and there's a dependence that many universities have on that, which has been driven by the reduction of Commonwealth funding for higher education in the past two or so decades. So you're seeing a, a real tension playing out right now between the government's immediate response to, to the coronavirus, uh, but, but, but it's uh, a, a apparent indifference, uh, some would describe as uh, hostility towards higher education. So, so I think there's, there's not a clear answer yet as to how we will go as a society uh, in, in terms of how we value scientific expertise. I want to uh, take a bit of time now just moving offshore. Stan Grant, uh, one of the things that's been happening before COVID-19 was an unravelling of the international rules-based order, particularly with the United States championing a kind of economic nationalism, which we had not seen before the uh, coming to power of President Trump. Now we've seen China managing its uh, coronavirus crisis, um, crisis compared to the United States, which seems to be in a lot of trouble at the moment. And a few people have been asking questions about what's going to happen now geopolitically. Is the US still a superpower or has it been proven to be weak in relation to China in a case like this? And what's it going to mean for Australia and its obligations in the region, both in terms of its own interests, but also, for example, the extent to which it extends aid beyond its own borders to the region at large? You know, there's a, a great line from Carl Schmitt, the, the German 1920s, 1930s political thinker and jurist, who said, sovereign is he who determines the exception. And there's been this contest of sovereignty that, is, that has been eroding that global multilateral liberal order for a couple of decades now. When you go back to the coalition of the willing and the Iraq invasion based on the, the false pretense of Saddam Hussein having uh, weapons of mass destruction, which sidestepped the normal processes, and that is getting the approval of the United Nations and so on to conduct uh, a conflict. Uh, is that you have the exam disregards a ruling in the Hague in the Maritime Court that says that they should not claim the disputed islands of the South China Sea and goes ahead and does that in any event. Power, uh, we, are, we have entered a new era now of big power politics and might is right and two global superpowers in the United States and China that represent totally different value political value systems. Uh, and so that, that was always going to be the defining question of the 21st century. And as I said earlier, I think coronavirus has accelerated that and widened the cracks that have already appeared. Um, there's been a loss of faith and trust in multilateral institutions, and that's been reflected 
in the rise of political populism, the increasing support for, for nativist uh, groups, uh, people who want to pull up the drawbridge. You know, you, you have people like Viktor Orban in Hungary who talk about illiberal democracy and putting up the borders again in Europe. You have the Brexit vote that was, to no small degree, um, driven by a sense of wanting to reclaim what it is to be British, to reclaim British sovereignty. You have Donald Trump, of course, with Make America Great Again. And that's not just shared in, in, the, in Western countries, but China under Xi Jinping talks about the China dream. He drives a narrative of historical grievance and resentment. Don't forget the 100 years of humiliation. Every Chinese school child can repeat that mantra. Vladimir Putin talks about how the, the West tried to humiliate Russia at the end of the Cold War. You know, Erdogan in, in, in Turkey talks about a revival of the caliphate. It's driven the, the Islamic terrorist movements from Al-Qaeda to ISIS. And this idea about reclaiming what it is to be Muslim and at a more hard-edged radical fundamentalist idea of Islam. These are the fractures that have appeared throughout the world and they have weakened that multilateral framework. And now sovereignty is back. And our own Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, said this in our parliament. Sovereignty does matter, whether that is increasing your manufacturing industry, stopping people coming to your country, uh, whether it is having to make choices about whether, you know, you can live in a world where China is our biggest trading partner and the United States is our biggest single strategic alliance. There's an old Chinese saying, two tigers can't live on the same mountain and it's very crowded mountain right now. Tim Tupolisar, do you see some of these uh, geopolitical tensions coming back and playing out here in Australia? I, the reason I ask is I, I'm thinking here about uh, Stan Grant's comments about there not just being uh, a clash of systems, but also a clash of potentially a clash of values. Uh, one of my neighbours has been very concerned about the treatment of people who have Chinese heritage in Australia, particularly during the coronavirus period, as if they've been targeted as somehow responsible for the virus, even though they are just as susceptible to infection as anybody else. I I'm just wondering whether you see some of these big civilizational clashes that could, one way of representing what's happening between the US and China is starting to have an impact here at home. We're certainly seeing anti-China or anti-Chinese Communist Party sentiment playing out here in Australia, and it's Australians of Chinese and more broadly Asian backgrounds bearing the brunt of this. So we've seen signs of scapegoating of people from Chinese and Asian backgrounds for COVID-19. This has been apparent in the many episodes of racial abuse, vilification, even assault that has occurred throughout the country where people have been targeted for, 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 for causing or contributing to uh, COVID-19 and its breakout. And I think that there is a conflation that is often made between uh, the, the, the Chinese party state and people of Chinese backgrounds. Um, you, know, you can be an Australian uh, who happens to have Chinese uh, background or heritage, uh, but that won't necessarily stop people from judging you as though you were connected to China uh, or the, the Chinese party state. Um, so I, I would share the concerns that others have expressed about the rise of anti-China sentiment turning into anti-Chinese sentiment or racism uh, that, that that is directed at people here. Uh, and, and I would say that COVID-19 has given an excuse for many people to vent feelings of racial uh, prejudice um, and, 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 and I've been alarmed really at how quickly we've seen things descend because, as you say, Simon, viruses don't discriminate and nor should we. Uh, and, and, and if you were to uh, look at the facts and look at how things have played out in Australia. Uh, many more cases of coronavirus have been imported here from Europe and the United States as opposed to um, from, from China. But that's kind of beside the point. I think we have seen something here that has been profoundly damaging to our social fabric. And to a large extent, it does reflect the 
or, or, or it, it is tied up with the concerns that people have with geopolitical shifts occurring uh, in the world right now. Right, well, we've only got a few minutes left. I'm just going to go to each of you with a final question. The proposition for this session, really echoing the language of the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, is that there will be a snap back to normal in November. Starting with you, Rebecca Huntley, do you think the Australian public is going to be ready for, will accept a snapback, which is basically to return to the status prior to the infection, prior to March? Look, the first thing I'd say is there's no, the research shows there's no expectation that we're going to snap back quickly. Most people think for the next 12 months we'll be feeling economic and social concerns from this as well. Like I said, there's going to be a kind of a real psychological pull to return to normal. That always happens when something traumatic happens. But I really hope, and this is where leadership is so critical, that we have leaders that say, going through this, we've seen the strengths and weaknesses of our economy and society, and in order to be prepared for any crises that comes towards us, whether that be environmental, economic or health, there are some things we have to address. So I hope we don't waste this crisis. I hope that we um, do whatever we can to, to come out of this and to continue on in a way that sets us up to deal with what I think is going to be some of the biggest crises coming down the track on us to us, and that is around climate change. Stan Grant, uh, do you think that the public will take an immediate winding back of JobKeeper and JobSeeker returning being cut back in half, or do you think the government's going to be forced to soften, if you like, the return and delay it, given that the changes that have been made now will in some senses still be required? You know, I, I think I would hope that there is enough government in our lives to give us the support that we need to come through this and try to recover as much as we can of the businesses and the jobs that have existed before. I hope there's not too much government that it gets in the way of what Australians can do really well, and that is use our initiative, use our freedom, use our ability to to tie it up with wire and keep it on the road, to get things done. I think that's what's going to be really important for us. Um, of course, there's going to be an expectation that people are going to need to be supported. Um, JobKeeper, um, increasing the job seeker during this period has been crucial. And we know that there was a debate going into this that job seeker was not, it was not enough, it was not sufficient, and that we needed to increase that. I would hope that that support remains for people who've been doing it tough. I hope that we can maintain JobKeeper long enough to allow people to get back into, into their jobs when their businesses are fully up and running and fully functioning. I hope that there's enough government to support us to get over the bridge, as they've said, to get to the other side and then to give us the freedom and the capacity to apply our initiative to, to build the country that we want to build and to take stock of the changes that we need to take stock of, to build a better country, to be able to come through this in a sense that we are all in this together. It's going to be a critical period and, and, and it's going to test us indeed as the coronavirus crisis itself has tested us. Thanks. And Tim, very quickly, if there's going to be rolling crises and we need to have our institutions fit for it, What's the top thing that you would have done, just in 30 seconds? What would be your number one priority? Well, I, I would think that it's about ensuring that we take out of the social solidarity that's been unleashed in recent months and harness that for nation building and the common good. Uh, societies should, ex should, should exist uh, not to serve markets, rather markets should exist to serve society and governments have to be there to provide a safety net when things fail. I think they're the uh, confronting realities that we face right now, and, and, and I would hope that government and leadership can do something to ensure that we get as much social solidarity and trust out of this so that we can embark on a project of national recovery and nation building. Thanks, Tim. Well, before I thank all of our guests, I also want just to acknowledge all of my colleagues at the Ethics Centre that have helped to make this possible and the team from Doppler over the course of this weekend. 
It's a wonderful group that brought this together very quickly. But as we bring Fodi Digital to a conclusion, which will be done more formally in a moment, please join with me in thanking our guests today, Rebecca Huntley, Tim Sutpomasan, and Stan Grant. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. Thanks for joining us this weekend for Fodi Digital. The sessions will be available as video on demand from our website, and they'll also be released as podcasts through wherever you get your podcasts from. You can stay up to date by signing up to our e-newsletter at festivalofdangerousideas.com. Stay safe. The Festival of Dangerous Ideas and Fodi Digital is presented by the Ethics Centre. Our purpose is to bring ethics to the centre of everyday life through public experiences, education, thought leadership, advocacy, consulting and leadership programs. As a non-profit organisation, every single dollar is invested in pursuit of this purpose. Thanks to our donors and partners who help to make our programs happen. And you can donate via the website. Thank you.